And so what were your days like? And, you know, as you're in this really um, insular group in Albany, if you're comfortable yeah. sharing. Yeah, it was very controlled and like kind of sad, actually. Like when I look back at it, it's like I woke up at 6 a.m. I did all these little like routines and rituals that, you know, from the outside could be perceived as somebody with a lot of discipline. Um, But I was doing everything because I was afraid. Because if you didn't do it, there were punishments and consequences. And so it's like the same tool can be used for true personal growth and, you know, exploration, whether it's meditating or exercising or, you know, having a very organized schedule, all of those are good things, but they're not good when they're being used for your own detriment. And so I lived a very scheduled life where I had to ask permission to do things, permission to go here, permission to take this class, you know, permission to go have coffee with so-and-so and and there was a part of me that kind of liked not having control and a part of me that also resented it so like that was kind of like a through line of my whole experience it was like it's a weird thing to describe but I think a lot of us don't want to have to deal with life's difficult decisions and so it's sometimes easier to give that control up to somebody else but then at the same time, if that person has neg- like has bad in- like bad intent or you know isn't really on your side, they can lead you in any direction they want. So just like if you went to a true mentor and said, "Hey, like, do you think that this is a good decision for me?" They should be ethical enough or objective enough to be like, you know. I don't think that's a good thing for you, or I do think that's a good thing for you, but they're thinking about you. They're not thinking about themselves. All of this was about Keith and Allison and and the leadership of DOS and what served them. And that was really just breaking people down and turning them into robots. You mentioned punishments and consequences. What did those look like for you at that time? They were different for everybody. Um, but mine, a lot of them had to do with like deprivation. Mm-hmm. So like food deprivation, comfort deprivation, uh, like limiting my sleep or limiting my calories or like stupid things like not indulging in like Netflix or music or things that brought me joy. Like they were more about depravity and kind of Um, anything that made you happy they would have you write it down and so that they could take those things away from you and that varies from person to person you mentioned earlier having to share things about you that you said was a form of blackmail so were there threats as to publication or sharing of your intimate details that you had shared was that uh, yeah, they they were, but there was a part of me that didn't want to believe that that was true, that like I thought that they were, it was just lip service and that they were just trying to scare me um, so that I would behave a certain way. So I was sort of like very disconnected from the collateral. That's what they called it. Um, they didn't call it blackmail. Uh, and so there were threats of like, There were threats, but it wasn't constant threats. It was sort of always in the back of your mind. Like if your superior tells you to do X, you need to do it. And if you don't do it, your collateral will be released. So it wasn't like they needed to constantly tell you, you remembered that. Um, And I think living in that kind of state of high fear, uh, can change you and definitely changes your behavior. Will you, if you're comfortable, describe the extent of the impact that this, those deprivation, um, yeah, the deprivation I mean, that you were subjected to, like subjected to, it had an impact on you physically. Can you share with us those details? Completely. I mean, they were telling us that everything we were doing was for our highest good and our greatest benefit. But honestly, I was 
very unhealthy and like I was deprived of a lot of nutrients. I was deprived of a lot of calories. I was very underweight and my hair was falling out and I had no energy and I was constantly like in brain fog. I remember some people being like, you're like a zombie. And I would be upset that they were saying that because here I was thinking that I was, you know, becoming stronger, but really I was physically becoming weaker and weaker and mentally very weak. And I ended up after the, after I got out, I ended up working with the FBI for nine months. And I remember one of the things that they told me was that I was not in my right mind because of the state that I was in both from sleep deprivation and food deprivation. And that that really also alters your decision making. And I remember like kind of brushing that off. And then it took me a while to really like accept what that actually meant and doing research on other groups in how brainwashing works and how people get broken down. It's all similar tactics. So I had to just like accept that that had also been done to me and that that changed me. Can you describe the relationship you had with Rainier and what that looked like during your time in Albany? Mm -hmm. Um, Prior to moving to Albany, I didn't have much of a relationship with him at all. And to be honest, his presence or the way that they, you know, there was a lot of propaganda around Keith uh, or Keith Rainier um, from the higher ups in the organization. So, you know, they were saying he's the smartest man in the world. He's the, you know, most compassionate. He's the most this, he's the most that. And so I was like, okay, whatever. Like I, I wasn't there for Keith. And even when I was recruited into DOS, I didn't know about his participation until I was already very much I want to say under the spell or kind of I was already I'm losing the word right now but they had already had so much collateral on me by the time that I was introduced to Keith I felt like it was a special thing Mm -hmm. because they had already like primed me to believe that oh this person is going to be the person who's going to really help you grow. But I didn't really know the extent of his involvement in DOS, aka I did not know that he was the creator of DOS because we were being told that this was a female only empowerment program. So why would I imagine that he was involved? Although looking back, he was involved in everything. So I should have, I should have known, but you know, what a shoulda, coulda. Like it, the way that they made me relate to him was sexual in nature and that made me feel very uncomfortable right from the beginning and I didn't understand why I was like why do I have to flirt with this guy he's like the principal like you know what I mean like he like it just didn't I was like how does this how does me flirting with him or they they called it seduced they're like your first assignment is that you have to seduce Keith and I was like how does this relate to like me growing. I I didn't get it, but you weren't allowed to question because when you questioned, you got reprimanded. So quickly I realized like questioning is not going to get me what I wanted. And I remember there was one moment before I had to commit to the seduction assignment that I really tried to evade. And to the point where like I didn't follow through with it and I got reprimanded by Allison intensely to the point where she punished me into having to stay in Albany for 30 days. And because I was trying to avoid it, like there was a part of me that was like, I don't want to do this. But there was no, I don't want to do this in DOS. Like there was no on or off switch. Like once you were in, you were in. And so like the first couple of interactions that I had with him were really scary and like really uncomfortable and a lot of it had to do with like being nude and being like completely you know vulnerable 
in front of him asking I had to ask him to take a naked photo of me and it was odd and I wanted it over quick and I remember having so much adrenaline coursing through my body and I talk a lot about this in the documentary um, seduced inside the Nexium cult because it was like my brain was on override with the amount of fear that was coursing through my body that I actually was like in a rush, not thinking clearly about what had just happened. Simultaneously being told that this is the most ethical man in the world. So like very mixed feelings. And then over the course of the, I was in DOS for about two years, a little less. Um, Our relationship sort of changed and he became kind of like good cop where Allison was bad cop and they would switch around and it just kind of like became a blur of all these times where he would like just show up in the middle of the night or call me to his apartment or the library as they called it and make me wait naked like all these very dehumanizing things that I thought were for my benefit because I was being told that. But really, it was just like repeated molestation and rape. Mm. So it's very, it's like still really hard for me to talk about. And something that still really haunts me is, (coughs) excuse me, this feeling of not recognizing what was going on with with me at the time but also not being able to talk to anybody about it either and even though I was in my 20s I wasn't like a little kid but I was very much being treated like a child and also being told that I couldn't speak to anybody about this and it's kind of like that very isolating experience of feeling special but also feeling very dirty and ugly and that I think a lot of women experience when they have sexual abuse and you blame yourself like why didn't I say no or why didn't I But you do, like your your whole body is saying no. And that's something that I didn't realize at the time is like every time that I would be around him, I'd be like frozen. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like paralyzed, like with coursing adrenaline and like a huge pit in my stomach or my chest. And I I even would tell him, I'm like, every time we're together, I have this like radiating... (laughs) thing inside of me and he was like well that's your problem you need to work on that and I would be like oh duh like of course it is like once again you know you blame yourself and so it's just so easy and so common to continuously blame yourself for being victimized when really if I was in my right mind or if I was the person that I am now I would have been like get out of here but I just didn't have the strength And I didn't have those words and I didn't have the support because everyone would tell you that, oh, like, this is a great honor. Like anyone who was in your little circle who you could even remotely speak to, you weren't allowed to talk about the details, but you could talk about like, I had a meeting with Keith or, you know, Keith called me to his house and they would be like, ooh, that's so amazing, you know? So you're like thinking that that's a really incredible thing, but no one's actually speaking about the details of what's going on and everyone was in pain but no one was able to discuss it and it was all very much like smoke and mirrors during that time did were you aware of the branding occurring Mm -hmm. well I had already been branded and so that was something that happened relatively early on for Mm -hmm. me honestly I think that was a mental breaking point for me But I can only say that now. At the time, I thought it was like me really being committed. And I looked at it as like, I'm one of the committed ones. And like, once again, like that camaraderie that we spoke about before, it was like, 
this bonding over this secret society, there was something to that that actually felt good in a weird way. Um, it was like you had a secret amongst friends. Um, but then it was also isolating simultaneously. So it's like you – I really describe it – I wrote a book about this as well, about my experience in um, in Nexium called Still Learning. And I – uh, it's a memoir that I narrated, and I really felt like I was living two lives. Like I was living my secret life, and I was living the life that I was letting other people see, which was a life that was a lie. Like they would always tell me, India, just be good or be happy. Don't let anybody see you upset. Don't let anybody see you down. Don't like like they were very much aware of how they wanted us to be perceived because they didn't want anybody knowing that bad things were happening because obviously they did, but it's just such a mind like, like to think about how like one thing can be going on and you are convincing yourself that it's an entirely different thing. Like if you had asked me back then, how are you doing? I would be like, I'm fine. But really, like, I was dying inside. And, like, now the level of honesty that I have with myself is something that I've had to rebuild. Even sometimes it takes me time to communicate how I'm actually feeling. I've gotten a lot better at it because I have people that I love and trust in my life that I feel safe communicating that with. But there was a long time in my recovery, especially in the first couple of years, where if you had asked me, are you okay? I would have said yes when, when I wasn't, and I was not even aware of that. Can you describe the branding ceremony for you? Yeah, I, I go into great detail in that, um, in my book and in the documentary as well, but it was an out of body experience. Mm -hmm. And I just remember the four other women in the room. One of those women was Allison. Uh, and three others who were in my specific little group, which we called pods. Um, and it was incredibly painful and scary and also something that we could not say no to. And we were kind of encouraged to leave our bodies as like a transcendent thing. Like, look at how strong you are. You're not even like feeling the pain but like we definitely were feeling the pain. But I think because it was such great pain, I was not completely present. Like I just remember tears coming down my face, but like not really feeling. And then kind of like, again, that rush of adrenaline that overcomes you, that kind of hides or masks pain. Um. And then the and then I remember just like recovering and it really being like a big gaping oozing scar set down, you know, on my left hip that since then I've covered up with a tattoo because I didn't want to see those markings anymore. We were told that it was a symbol of the elements, which was also a lie. Um because it, we ended up learning that it was Keith Raniere's initials and we didn't know that. And so like for me, the learning curve of realizing that that's like what pimps do to prostitutes and like that's how you, you know, you treat people that are your property or all of that was something that I had to learn after the fact. And it's just, you're just kind of like the collision of reality with the collision of the perception that you had built is completely opposite. And a lot of that I learned while working with the FBI. For more episodes of the Fox True Crime podcast, go to foxtruecrime.com.